Hey, Hubs. Hello, wife. <laughs> Blowing the steam off of your coffee. Trying to get it down to non, you know, fusion you fusion levels to be able to drink it. But yeah, yeah I'll just wait. Just have to wait a little bit. Yep. <sighs> What's new? Not too much. Another day above ground, which I call a win. You probably call a loss because <laughs> no. I'm worth more dead than alive. But yeah. No. 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 no? You just don't want to be left with two kids and a dog and cats no, I, and I, all that stuff. Despite what it may look like, I do actually like you. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that's a plus. That's a plus. What's new with you? Uh, let's see. Not too much. Just uh, how's your jujitsu with... going? Jujitsu's going. Jujitsu's going. Um, I oh, let's see. We were working. How were we working on Saturday? Turtle top. Turtle top. Yeah. Yeah, and this chin strap thing. And I'm, I don't think I'm really a fan of that. <laughs> kind of hurts. Don't stick your head there and you won't get chin strapped. So. I, I'm not planning on it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm planning on protecting. Cool. Cool. <laughs> should we jump in? We should jump in. Yeah. Okay. Because people definitely or, don't yeah. come here for our play by play. Most part. Yeah. For the okay. most part. I need to go over here. Yeah. Questions. Okay. Our first question is from Pete on going in and out of ketosis. Hey Rob, I've been on and off a keto diet for the past five years or so and when in, keto when in ketosis, I feel fantastic. I train Muay Thai and on days that I train, I tend to up my carb intake as I just feel better throughout training, similar to you with jujitsu. On Sundays, however, I do tend to go off the rails a bit and find myself on Monday down around the 0.2 millimolar uh, per liter level and then by Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, back up to anywhere between 1.0 to 2.4 millimolars per liter, where I stay for the rest of the week. I have in the past gone several months at a time on a 30 to 50 gram carb per day diet on multiple occasions, haven't done so in the past year and a half or so. I've been hearing a lot lately that this quick fluctuation between low carb to moderate high carb intake can be very bad for you. Can you help shed some light on this? Am I doing long-term damage to my body by fluctuating? It's a really good question. Like there, there have been some studies recently, Bill Legacos uh, posted a, f a few of these where people on a ketogenic diet, um, and, and you know, I, I can't remember if it was actually human study or animal study. I'll have to uh, dig around on that. But basically they had a keto adapted organism, either human or, or rodent, um, uh, given some carbs blood glucose levels went quite high, high enough that, that you would anticipate some like damage to the vascular endothelium. And so the thought there was, was, uh, you know, low carb diets are dangerous because when people deviate off the low carb diet, then, you know, there's problems. And we definitely know that in the low carb state, people become physiologically insulin resistant or have a tendency to become physiologically insulin resistant, which what that means is in general, the muscles and the adipose tissue don't really take up as much glucose as what they did previously. And that the glucose is being spared for the brain and the red blood cells and the, the tissues that really have to have glucose. Um, but it, it, you know, in the context of, of something like this, like the way that Tyler and Luis have recommended for like keto gains and whatnot, um, a low glycemic load titration up in, in carbohydrates seems to be um, totally benign. Uh, doing the targeted approach uh, in which you're putting 10, 15 grams of glucose into the mix immediately pre-training, I, I, we really don't have good studies on that, but I can't imagine that that is a, a net negative, um, particularly when I, I see how well people perform on that and they feel good. Um, does it have more to do with how his blood glucose is responding when he jumps to high carb or is it, cause it seems like with the metabolic flexibility stuff, one that's one who is metabolically flexible, flexible should be able to go from you should, one to you the should. other. And so. it, it, the thing is, is we're only seeing a uh, blood ketone levels here. We're not really seeing okay. his blood glucose I guess levels. I'm, my question is, is what he's at, is this deviation that he's saying that, that could be dangerous? Is that, if the person's blood glucose levels. Yes, that, that's where the, the concern is. And we just don't have enough information here to really know what's going on. Um, you know, this is one of those tough things though, where is going on a complete hookers and cocaine carb binge while keto adapted a bad thing? Yeah, 
is going on a complete hookers and cocaine car binge a bad while thing under, a, a while eating whatever yeah American diet. I, like and this is one of the things that I, I think is quite frustrating and the vegans as I'm I'm calling them now uh, uh, they will cite these studies where you eat a high fat diet and you get um, disruption in vascular endothelial function any meal causes a disruption in vascular endothelial function this is why we shouldn't fucking graze all day and we should eat you know, a, a meal here, a meal there, and, and then have periods of time where we're not uh, uh, putting calories into our system. Because every time you eat, there's a systemic inflammatory response. You get a little bit of lipopolysaccharide that goes through the gut barrier into so systemic not if you're circulation. Just plants. Of course, if you're not eating plants. Um, <laughs> I'm tired enough right now that Nikki nearly got like a spinning elbow off of that one. So yeah, of course, plants only don't don't cause any of these problems, but. This is where, it, you know, and, and this is something actually now that I'm thinking about it, it would be worthwhile to look at what's the disruption in endothelial function when somebody's low carb and eats a carb rich meal versus just Joe Schmo is motoring along and then they eat a car, you know, a carb and or a fat rich meal and see what the vascular endothelial dysfunction is in, in that scenario. Um, this stuff, again, also, it boils down to, are you overeating, both in amount and frequency? Um, this is some stuff that's also really interesting, where they took people who were caloric restricted and relatively few meals, like two or three, or calorie restricted and like six or eight meals a day. And the calorie restricted plus six or eight meals per day had no real benefit with regards to systemic inflammatory function and like a bunch of other biomarkers of like aging and inflammation. So over, eating too frequently is is a problem, even when even we add in calorie right. restriction, wow. you know, so you can completely undo that. So, man, I don't know, like it, it's, um, it makes a case for just not being an asshole with your food. Like if you're kind of eating low carb, kind of stick with low carb, and particularly in this day and age, if you want some ice cream, get like some mammoth creamery or like some killer way low carb ice cream. If you want some cookies, get some Nui cookies or something. Like if you're generally eating low carb, then generally figure out a fucking way to eat low carb. If you're if you're not, then then um you know kind of work within that. But I, I do think that um it, it's a really good question. Pete raises a, a great question and I don't think we have remotely like all the answers on this there's a lot of moving parts to it but there is just kind of a reality if we don't overeat if we're not eating at a ridiculous meal frequency which ironically two or three meals per day seems to be a reasonable meal frequency you're getting enough um evil mTOR activation that you don't totally wither away all your muscle mass and die from sarcopenia but you also are not eating so frequently that we're getting an, a, a, a real legit upregulation in systemic inflammatory signaling and whatnot. So, you know, again, uh, Pete, I don't know if I really answered your question there, but there, there's a lot going on with this. And, and also, like, how far off the rails are you going? Like, are you doing, like, 800 grams of carbs or are you doing 200? You know, I think that, that can play into it, too. And if it's post-workout or something, it's a really different story versus uh, to, like... Um, our, our weeks tend to be a little bit more sedentary on the front end. Um, we, we we're not even really making it to formal jujitsu class on Tuesday, Thursdays right now because of workload. We're lucky if we go out in the garage and do a little bit of drilling. So like on the front end of the week, I'm not really eating much in the way of carbs. Whereas like uh, Friday, Saturday, um, those tend to be bigger training days. And so like I'll have a couple of oranges for breakfast and then I'll, in addition to all my other stuff, and then we'll do jujitsu. And then based off of how knackered I am from that jujitsu training session, I may do, so the two oranges are like 40 grams of carbs alone. And then after that, I may have the equivalent of like three or four more oranges. So I end up, you know, that hundred to 120 grams per day of, of, uh, carbohydrate, but I, I feel good with that. I don't get a crazy blood sugar crash. I'm not tracking ketones, but I just kind of dose it appropriate to my activity level. Whereas if I'm just sitting working, mm -hmm. I don't need it. Like, I just don't need it. I don't need that many calories. I don't need that many carbs. And so I, I, I just don't, don't throw it in. So to your point, there's a lot of mitigating, strategies that can be employed like exercise and the meal timing and stuff like that okay 
Our next question is from Chris about deficits below basal metabolic rate. Hey guys, over the past seven months, I've had great success following the Keto Masterclass. As far as weight loss goes, I've lost 42 pounds, lowered my body fat percentage from around 28% to about 19%. For the first 12 weeks, I ate at a 20% deficit without a break. I weighed and measured all my food, and I made sure I had my electrolytes dialed in, eating lots of potassium and magnesium-rich foods, supplementing sodium as well as magnesium too. During that time, I was lifting four times per week, as well as a couple of 15 to 20 minute interval workouts per week. Other than that, I was doing some light walking and playing with my kids. Towards the end of that initial run, I started to get kind of bitchy. I'm a 45 year old male and never really experienced this, never really experienced the stable energy or deep solid sleep that a lot of people mention. two things I was really hoping for. Recently, I've been alternating four week cuts followed with two week full diet breaks a la Lyle McDonald at maintenance. During those, carb sources have been clean paleo foods. Coming off of each of these, I feel better and maintained a stable weight throughout. I was normally back in ketosis in 48 to 72 hours after switching my carb and fat macros back up. And both times, so far, it has restarted weight loss. Still not great sleep, but I attribute that to having young kids, two and six. After a recent DEXA scan, I was recalculating my macros with the Keto Gains calculator. I'm 162 pounds and 19% body fat, and it dawned on me that the deficit it was recommending, about 15%, was putting me below my basal, basal metabolic rate by about 105 calories per day. For reference, I use the sedentary activity level and don't add back in workout calories. So to my questions. Understanding that the calculator is based off of the catch mccardle formula, basically giving a statistical norm, but BMR is the calories we need to maintain vital physiological functions, what are your thoughts on recommended deficits putting one below their BMR, and what are the longer term implications of extended diets doing so? Would it be better to just eat at BMR on rest days and add back in some all a portion workout calories on training days while still being below TDEE? It seems to me that BMR should be an absolute floor when it comes to caloric intake. I'm wondering if the aggressive deficits created some diet fatigue and hormonal disruption for me. Love the podcast and anything the Wolf Pack puts out. Thanks for everything. Man, uh, really good stuff. Um, we read these ahead of time. We actually do. And I, I, I was noodling on how to tackle this one because it, it raises a lot of a lot of questions and, and uh, is difficult to really... Um, uh, so we've talked about in the past where, uh, I think we've talked about on here, this is where like I'm feeling like an old man that just tells the same story again and again well, and again. a lot of the questions have similar veins. They, they have somewhat so similar veins, yeah. but also coming off of like FitCon and then Paleo FX, like I know I told this story several times and so it's kind of like, okay, I think I've said this, but I can't remember. But anyway, the point being is that um, I've noticed that I seem to motor along with probably about 20, 25% fewer calories than what you would expect based off like weight and, and activity level and all that type of stuff. Uh, Luis has mentioned the same thing. Um, we kind of see it within the Keto Gains community. I remember ages ago, uh, Coach Greg Glassman, founder of CrossFit, uh, we were talking about the zone, which interestingly, when you really look at it in its, it's kind of like fully formed uh, format, which Barry Sears did a shit job of explaining the kind of like athletic interpretation of the zone, which is about a 60 to 65% fat fueled diet, mainly from monounsaturated fats, moderate carb, appropriate protein. Like it's actually, ironically, I think I end up eating pretty close to what the like 5X fat zone recommendations are, which is fucking ironic considering all the, all the past and all that stuff around that. But um, what Greg Glassman mentioned is that when people get in... He, he called it a thermodynamically efficient state, which, which, which is going to be all kinds of controversial. And I think we have a question later about the kind of thermodynamics in, in the story, story calories in, calories out. But he just noticed that people seem to motor at about 20 to 25 percent fewer calories than what you would otherwise expect when they're eating kind of kind of junk or or maybe not as as nutrient dense. And um. It's interesting because people freak out about that. Like there's kind of the repeat camp and there are some people that are super geeked out on like eating as much as you possibly can short of gaining body weight. And and sometimes folks get some decent results off that. Like maybe they've, they've kind of tanked their hormonal profiles. But then what's always interesting about that when you dig in, uh, 
what was their training volume really like? Were they really supplementing uh, sodium in an appropriate way? Were they a night shift worker? Like there's all these kind of moving parts to it that it, the, the blame is always placed on the dietary intervention, which maybe it was, but there's all these other extenuating circumstances that, that we know can influence this stuff. So the, the, you know, the, I guess kind of the main question here is, uh, is it a bad idea to eat below basal metabolic rate? That basal metabolic rate, which is it Pete? Chris. It Chris, yeah. um, Chris pointed out is a, a guesstimation. It's kind of a, a normal distribution. Um, it's entirely possible, and I, I think it's reasonable that when people eat a more nutrient dense diet, they probably re require generally fewer calories to, to get the same kind of processing done. Um, so I don't know that this one is is really a scenario in which, you know, the the people were surprised by how few calories they eat on keto games. Like again and again, people are like, I can't believe that this is what you guys are recommending, but when people get in and actually relax into the process, then they get great results. They're, we don't see like thousands and thousands of people with HPTA axis dysregulation and, you know, because they make sure to stay on point with the protein and with the sodium in particular and stuff like that. So um, I don't know if I'm fully, uh, yeah, like the, the not great so sleep. Been, yeah, just... He's and when I hear supplementing, it, it's so up above, he says supplementing sodium. Okay, but how much exactly how much? And yeah. are you for sure getting at least Especially given the fact that day? you're lifting four times a week and yeah. doing interval workouts as well. Like there are people in the keto gains community doing 10 grams of sodium a day if they're active. And more. And more. Yeah. Um, so, we don't talk a lot about that because as it is, people are all freaked out. But yeah. Yeah. But, the, but these individuals find that they perform that's, much they're, better they're they feel better and, their sleep and that's is better where their set point is so if you're if you're only doing a thousand or two thousand milligrams of sodium you might try no you a, have to a, like you, you have to and this is it, like uh finney and volick's original work which gets ignored a lot they mainly focused on like adding bullion cubes and stuff like that but they recommended an, a minimum of kind of five grams per day mm -hmm. and that was just for like your run-of-the-mill kind of keto type person and then you start adding in uh, volume and intensity of training and all these other considerations then you know we have some some problems there so I guess the long and short of that is I would I would definitely look at uh, uh, sodium and electrolyte intake it, it as fastidiously as you have your macros, um, macros and um I mean, it burned it at the stake on the interwebs, but I'm I'm not as concerned. It, it's interesting in a time when people are so geeked out about like fasting and and caloric restriction and all these longevity hacks and everything. Um, so on the one hand, that's real popular, but then on the other hand, people are concerned that a nutrient dense diet may actually be a little more thermodynamically efficient. Like you just literally may not need quite as much food. That's not saying that in Chris's scenario, he doesn't necessarily need a, a few more calories, but if the goal is still leaning out, we still need a caloric deficit and you got to mm -hmm. get that by hook or by crook. Um, you could do a more modest caloric deficit. You could do kind of a zigzag pattern where on training days you do more calories and on non-training days you do fewer. But, you know, there are ways of breaking that up, but I'm not as... Um, I'm not as concerned about that as what I was in the past, um, particularly if people are on point with electrolytes and the, the food is nutrient dense and all that type of stuff. And again, the interwebs will crucify us, but that's okay. They did on the alcohol question. Man, man. Yeah, we're going to do some outtake stuff. <laughs> we have to do stuff outtake on, on that one. On that, yeah. Let's see. Uh, next question is from Zach on energy balance. Uh, Gary Tobbs versus Chris Kresser. Hey, Rob, longtime follow and really appreciate the work you're doing. I wish I had known about keto and paleo when I was younger. I feel my athletic performance could have propelled me to the next level. Either way, I'm happy to have it in my life today as it keeps me thin and healthy. Your keto masterclass has been instrumental in guiding me through my keto paleo journey. So thank you. I've been very interested in the low carb diet for 10 plus years now, and it started with Gary Tobbs. Gary Tobbs is famous for saying that calories don't count, and in my anecdotal experience, they don't. I must stress that since it works for me, I'm completely happy with the results. However, when trying to speak intelligently about keto and low carb, I'm trying to get bridge a gap from Gary to Chris Kresser's podcast with Joe Rogan last week. 
On Joe Rogan, Chris said that you must run a caloric deficit to lose weight. Now I'm really confused. I'm an engineer and have taken several thermodynamics courses, so from an energy balance equation, I understand that the human body cannot defy thermodynamic pr principles. But obviously our metabolism is much more complex than an energy in, energy out black box. Furthermore, energy in, energy out does not feel right for a number of reasons, such as, for instance, energy expended drinking cold water is not in this equation. That is your body warming the cold water up. Energy that is never consumed, but rather part of a defecation event, etc. I have eaten uh, what I perceive to be a major energy surplus on a ketogenic diet and have still lost weight. My caveat there is that I wasn't weighing food, so I cannot really know. My apologies if you've already answered this question, but I could not find it on your blog or searching your website. I'm hoping you can point me to a study, a white paper, or a text, or some reliable information that will answer the question of who's right. Gary Tobbs or Chris Kresser? Thanks, Rob. You're a legend. Man, um, so when, my initial foray into the whole low carb scene was uh, it, it, it was just prior to Gary's first uh, really popular paper, the soft science of dietary fat, and and a um, couple of other papers. But this was around two thousand one that Gary's first paper came out, and it was really kind of this. Uh, it was pretty powerful because. It, it received a lot of attention, a lot of bandwidth, and it was validating for kind of the, the very nascent and early low-carb paleo kind of, kind of ancestral health scene. There was nobody out there fighting for this or advocating for it. or it, like It was really kind of like the dark ages of, of kind of putting these ideas forward. And Gary's work was really kind of a beacon of hope. And I've got to say that for me... Having been on a carbohydrate roller coaster my whole life prior to this, and I, I was kind of lean, but not really lean. And then when I when I went low carb, I, I would just like pour olive oil on my food and eat it. And I, I was like Skeletor lean. And I was also younger and I was much more active. And, you know, there were all these other factors, but I could eat with pretty much reckless abandon and be as lean as I wanted to be. And I had rock solid energy levels, and I, I, I think that that is a not uncommon experience for many people. And this is part of why Gary's idea that he threw out there that it's not really the calories, it's just the insulin, had some stickiness because on at a macro level, there were a lot of people that that their personal experience kind of matched up with that. And then even working with clients, we had clients that. We just changed the qualitative nature of their food and they were still eating like a Costco container of like almonds or cashews or whatever as part of their overall eating strategy. And they were still losing weight relative to what they were doing before. Um, to Zach's point, um, they still may have been introducing some degree of a caloric deficit in this whole thing. Um, at the end of the day, there's a huge variation. And, and Zach, you touched on some of these things like... Some people absorb more calories out of their diet than other folks do. Like just tweaks in the gut microbiome can make people 10, 20% more efficient at harvesting calories out of the food that would otherwise hmm. just pass through. Um, people with celiac disease, and this is where the gut microbiome gets really interesting. They're always like diversity, diversity, diversity. But folks with celiac, celiac disease tend to have a more diverse gut microbiome and the thought there is that it's kind of a, a response to the fact that the person is likely suffering nutrient deficiencies because of the gut damage and so they're trying to prop up the microbial diversity so that there's more opportunity to actually harvest nutrients into the gut it's kind of you know entirely speculative there's not a randomized control trial on this so clearly like the you know the nortons and ergons of the world are gonna like take a, a shit down the back of the whole notion but um it, it's uh, uh, it's really interesting, and there's a remarkable spread and variation on that side. There's a pretty good spread on just even the way that people um, manifest, you know, calories at the mitochondrial level. Like I've talked about that in my metabolic flexibility talk, where some people are really kind of jammed up in that. Uh, uh, kind of carb dependent mitochondrial complex and those people um they 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 kind of burn more energy inefficiently they're producing a lot of uh, reactive oxygen species but it's a more caloric intensive process 
It's not necessarily good, though. It's like, oh, I get to eat more food. And it's like, yeah, and you're aging and oxidizing yourself at a, a faster rate. This is part of the benefit of being metabolically flexible and tending towards fat mobilization and fat utilization as kind of a primary fuel source. You tend, going through that mitochondrial complex too, you tend to produce fewer reactive oxygen species, which is arguably more thermodynamically efficient. But at the end of the day, it's still all... The thermodynamics are legit, but what, what gets lost in this story is one person's thyroid profile is X, another person's is Y. And depending on the delta between those, one may be far more efficient with calories than the other one. And there's pluses and minuses to both of those stories. So uh, what's unfortunate, in my opinion, with Gary, I, I really like the guy, I consider him a friend, but... He got wrapped around the axle of proving the insulin hypothesis instead of having that be a potentiality. But he really linked his whole wagon and existence to proving that versus I suggested ages ago, 10 years ago, when Nusi was just kind of in its infancy. Let's focus on the outcomes and the fact that low-carb diets really benefit people. And let's focus on the outcome-driven element instead of being so wed to proving the mechanistic side. Now, I understand the, the impetus there. Um, if you, in theory, if you can prove mechanism of causation, then you know we have, in theory, better control of what's going on. But this is just a nearly infinite process. Like, at, at, at the end of the day, there's huge spectrums and variation. I was on a podcast yesterday where I was talking about this stuff, and... Just thinking about like caffeine metabolism, there are some people that if you give them 100 milligrams of, of caffeine, in four hours, they have metabolized half of it. So the, the, the half-life, Luis, for example. There are other people that the half-life for caffeine for them is 30 hours. Mm. So we've got nearly a 10x spread on just the ability to metabolize a, a, a common, you know, feature of, of our existence, you know, caffeine. And so you have nearly a 10x spread. And I don't think that there's remotely that big of a spread with regards to like the way that calories impact people. But what if it's a 2x spread or a point or a 25% spread? That ends up manifesting hugely over the course of like a 2000 calorie diet. You know, I mean, it, it could be the you know, 400 calories plus or minus one, one way or the other. And I, I don't know what the real story is there, but we, we do know that there's massive variation from person to person. And um, uh, what is the guy's name? The, the great Randy or whatever. Like the, there's this guy that's had like a million dollar offer for people to prove um, psychic abilities and paranormal stuff. And it's been since like the, the mid eighties and nobody's been able to do it. Like, so far, paranormal shit doesn't seem to exist. Um, everybody has failed to produce it. And so this, this notion that somehow there's a workaround thermodynamics in the body is kind of ridiculous on the one hand, or maybe not ridiculous, but it's not, the, it, 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 it's not being supported over the, the course of time. But then the thing that I think that the it fits your macros and the evidence-based nutrition folks kind of miss is that the the complexity of that thermodynamic story is jaw-droppingly complex and it, it, it the um the fact that people overeat due to complex food combinations and hyperpalatable foods and stress and like all this other stuff kind of gets dismissed and and it, it's not really woven into a, a holistic approach to helping people manifest change so I know that was all over the place, Zach. It's just, it's a really interesting big topic, but I, I would have to say that um, this is a situation in which Gary, in my opinion, got fooled mm -hmm. by an observational element, which is that there are some people that just seem able to eat a ridiculous amount of calories on a low carb or ketogenic diet and either maintain weight or, or lose weight. But at the end of the day, uh, Presser is a bit more on point with this stuff and that you've got to uh, uh, introduce some sort of a caloric deficit to really And we see this on out. keto all the time because people will be like, oh, just eat all the fat and you'll lose weight. And for some people it works and for other people they gain weight on keto. So, And what we find with that is that the, the folks that are focusing on fat are under eating protein. And because of the protein leverage hypothesis, we have a decent understanding that 
If we under eat protein, we will be goosed to eat more of whatever is out there in an attempt to get appropriate nutrition. And that could be higher carb or, or lower carb, but there's kind of a reality that if we hit that appropriate protein threshold, then people tend to spontaneously reduce caloric intake. Okay. And that's all I've got to say on that. Our next question is from Andrea. Uh, has, has pre and post surgery nutrition buildup been covered? She says, hi, kids and kitties and squatchies. <laughs> so it's been a little while since I've been de- since I have been devouring each and every single podcast episode, and I apologize. My own business focus has put me more into the writing podcast genre recently, but I see Tim Grawl on your interview e-list. Uh, so my question, have you guys laid out a protocol for extreme nutrient buildup for before and after a scheduled surgery? This would be for someone who is not really paleo, still eats gluten, and mostly just avoids sugar and junky foods. So they are not yet on the rar sardines from nom nom bandwagon, sadly. <laughs> But if they have a willingness to make some changes to ensure they're in a better place to prepare to recover from their surgery, jaw replacement, if it matters, what would you prescribe to them? And family, so if this guidance comes from an outside authority that could make the critical difference in their enthusiasm. P.S. Love to all you guys. You're doing the chop wood, carry the water, and have been for so long. I bow in respect. I hope to see you again soon at some rando paleo conference, Andrea in Burbank. That's awesome. Yeah, some days I feel like sticking my head under the the chopping of wood. um, Or or in the bucket of water. Or in the bucket of water, yeah, yeah. Um, Man, this is is an interesting question. Uh, It's going to be reasonably controversial, but uh, hey, what? isn't that, that we do it, at this point, but we've, we noticed something when we moved to Reno, we had a couple of people reach out to us and they were super excited. The fact that we were here and they ended up being plastic surgeons. And what we discovered was that through processes that I still am not entirely aware of, but um, people were coming into their program and they, they want like a boob job or they want this or they want that. And and somebody suggested, hey, why don't we do a lifestyle program for these people first? And what it was was a low carb, peri, ketogenic, paleo, paleo type, type deal. And what they noticed was that one, people ended up losing shocking amounts of weight on this program. And then when they got, so people would go in frequently like tummy tucks were the big deal. That's what it was. People, tummy tucks were the, the big deal or liposuction and or liposuction. People would do this lifestyle deal of eight to 12 weeks of a, uh, a paleo challenge type type gig. They got done with that and then they're like, wow, I don't need a tummy tuck anymore. And so then they're like, well, what about boobs and eyebrows and all this stuff? So, And then when they would do the surgery on these people, they were sh- just Recovering. stunned with how well they recovered. I mean, shocked with how well they recovered scarring was like virtually non-existent and something that people don't really appreciate is that these these big glucose spikes and crashes with regards to like scar formation are really nasty Hmm. with regards to um immune response are really terrible like these big glucose deltas cause suppression and immune response so everything that you would kind of want to go into effective healing is kind of fucked up with bad diet um I had LASIK done with 2007 or eight. Yeah. 2007, no, it, was 2008. Eight. it was eight. It was okay. after we went to Nicaragua because you had your glasses when you were trying That's to right. snorkel there. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It sucked. <laughs> um, so I, I went to this guy. He's one of the best uh, LASIK surgeons on the West coast. I was ketogenic at the time because I had read a lot of stuff about wound healing and, and it, it was very early, but it, in, the, in my mind, re- reduced glycemic load and all that stuff made a ton of sense. Did the surgery. It went great. I was ecstatic. Went back like two weeks later, three weeks later, a month, whatever it was to, to get checked up. And the doctor literally like, you know, so I'm sitting looking in this thing and he looks and then he looks around and he looks in there and he looks around. And he's like, you, you aren't fucking with me, are you? And I was like, I, I don't know what you mean. And he's like, you, it is you. You don't have a twin. And I'm like, no, I don't. And then he, he was like, you have absolutely no scarring from the surgery. I mean, like none. He could detect no scarring. And what's interesting is most people with LASIK, uh, they, they talk about like chromatic aberrations where like when they drive at night, they get these kind of halo effects. And it's just, oh, gee whiz, it's just kind of the, 
the downside of doing this and knock on one, but I, I, I have had no problem with that. I get a little bit of dry eye. Like if the wind blows in my eyes after LASIK, that, that has been a little bit of a problem where my eyes will, will water. But he said that I would need a tune up on this stuff and, or would need reading glasses, uh, like five years ago, six years ago, more than that. But it, every once in a while, if I have a really fine print, I will pull out some, some reading glasses, but I had no scarring. Um, the, the LASIK has lasted way longer than it was supposed to. And we've heard kind of similar reports from people. So um, so as far as like a prescription, like this person's going into surgery, let's say like three or four weeks from now, like beef, salmon, blueberries. Kind of low carb, paleo type, type deal, even just for the weeks leading up to and the weeks afterwards. I mean, at a... At a minimum and uh, the the recover i i would again kind of knock on one but it, it's really interesting um sean baker is a surgeon like most of the people that were early to adopt low carb have been surgeons because they would see someone change their diet and then it wasn't like oh well i don't know their cholesterol went up and you know an internal medicine person is like i don't know if it really did all that much but a fucking surgeon, they're looking at like suture lines and wound healing and, and complications and they're keeping statistics on that. And that's where the plastic surgeons that, that we've met and have become friends with in, in Reno, they were like their complication rate just plummeted with people. They all got to a point where they're like, no, you need to do this lifestyle program first before I'm going to do anything. And it became a little bit of a, a non-negotiable deal there. So... For this person, it sounds like they still kind of eat so, kind of poorly. and it, But, I mean, just trying to get a little bit on, on top of a, a lower glycemic load, paleo-type uh, approach, this might be an, an argument for uh, uh, an exogenous ketone deal <laughs> where they're, they're using them before, during, and, and after this process um, because the ketogenic state is itself anti-inflammatory. It tends to promote uh, a lowering in blood glucose levels and whatnot. So th this is maybe one of those scenarios where we're uh, an exogenous with ketone. as much, you know, nutrients. As clean as you could, as yeah. As you can. Yeah. yeah. And sardines. To and be sardines. on the non -non bad bandwagon. Yeah. Everybody wants to be on that bandwagon. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. Okay, our next question is from Matt. CrossFit versus 5 by 5 do I have a phone call right now? I have one in two minutes. You have one in two minutes. But okay. I can call him back. Okay. Uh, Matt says, Rob and Nikki, thanks for all that you do. You, your books, and podcasts have changed my life. I have done two days a week of CrossFit for just over two years, and in spite of the amount of rest I get, I still end up with knee, shoulder, wrist, and elbow injuries and pain. I recently decided to pause my CrossFit subscription and have replaced it with three days a week of 5x5 five five routine recommended by the Keto Gains guys. I did your keto masterclass and I'm at seven and a half percent body fat and try to keep my macros on point with the keto gains recommendations. What do you think about just doing the five by five home workout alone? I do like the group element of the CrossFit class, but at my age, 52, I can't seem to go for long without injury or constant pain. I feel like the five by five program at home is much more manageable as I can control the velocity and intensity without so much emotional effort. What are your thoughts regarding this path? Yeah, well... Sounds you're like you're on a good path, Matt. You're on Matt. a good path, yeah. <laughs> you're doing largely what we've done. And a couple of thoughts on the community piece. You could look around for a, a gym like uh, Sarah and Grayson with Basis in Chico. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of gyms that either that have shifted out of CrossFit, are still CrossFit, but offer like a barbell program. Uh, there are a few affiliates that Mark Ripito has put out there where they're a starting strength gym. So you could poke around and try to find a gym that is more amenable oriented. to just, just lifting and maybe pushing a prowler and doing some, Without some the competitive basic conditioning. And, yeah. yeah. The, and this is the reason why we modified our programming early on. We just ceased for certain classes, ceased writing names on the board and all that stuff. Cause people needed the community more than they needed the, the competition. The other thought is to join a jiu-jitsu school, which itself can be problematic because we're back into that quality mm -hmm. control deal. You need to find a good school. If you live near a straight blast gym affiliate, then that's great. There's not a ton of them around. So you would need to do some poking around because one that has a lot of women and older folks. Yes. That's not just yeah. 20 year old guys that want to somehow 
be in the UFC one day. Right. Um, yeah. So, but otherwise, you're you're kind of you're facing somewhat the same challenges as you do from CrossFit gym with jujitsu gyms, and that if they cater overly to the competition side of things, then it it, it you're going to be in the same kind of dinged up, like broken mm-hmm. kind of scenario. Mm-hmm. But yeah, lifting. Yeah, getting lift, out, walking, doing lift, things walk, you enjoy, sprint, and then yeah, uh, the sun. Shoot, play. Take a, we we we've been talking. We did um. Uh, some salsa dancing years ago uh, because we were invited to a big hoity-toity wedding where the in Mexico, yeah. Yeah, in Mexico where the gypsy kings were going to be playing and yeah. we didn't want to suck and so we <laughs> practiced like crazy but that's something we want to get back into mm-hmm. is just like doing some salsa dancing or something like that to to have a little bit of community learn a new skill set and all that type of stuff it's it, it's big like that that community piece is is huge for sure yeah all right anything else you want to add that's it all right. I think we're done for this week. Thank you guys for your questions. As always, uh, if you have questions, submit them at robwolf.com via the contact page. At Das Rob Wolf on Instagram. Yeah, these clips also go out on YouTube. And this episode is sponsored by Drink Element. So stay salty, Stay folks. salty. And uh, just as an aside, uh, we had Zoe's birthday party this past weekend, and somebody brought us Element Jello mm-hmm. shots. Um, uh-huh. Non boozy for the kids and boozy for the adults and that was pretty legit so we'll share that recipe with you guys at some point all right thanks guys bye